So are folks now seeing the, um, the first slide? Fantastic, okay. Great, well, um, thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know it's been a really long and interesting day and we're so pleased that you're um, here with us. Uh, a, a little bit of a caveat, we had actually only um, applied to be in the 20 minute category of presentation. Um, and so while we, um, have attempted to uh, flesh out our, our work a little bit. We may not be going the full 40 minutes, but I suspect that's not gonna be um, too sad for anyone. So um, again, my name is Liz Bedford. Um, Lindley and I work for the University of Washington Libraries, and we were invited by some faculty at the UW School of Dentistry uh, to create this course that was designed to help some um, graduates, PhDs um, in the field of dentistry and orthodontia take their dissertation work and um, turn it into articles, basically. So I wanted to start off by sharing the University of Washington land acknowledgments. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm a white settler currently living in the traditional territory of the Duwamish tribe. These are the original and ongoing stewards of Seattle and King County. And while they were among the signatories of the 1885 Treaty of Point Elliot, they currently do not have federal recognition. Um, they've been petitioning for this recognition for over 40 years and briefly won it in January 2001. But that ruling was voided in 2002 by the Bush administration because of procedural errors. So if you're interested in learning more about this, I really encourage you to visit the tribe's website, which also has a link to a change.org position calling for federal recognition. And I'm going to share that link in the chat. So today, Lindley and I are gonna be talking about the course that we participated in, um, and then also be talking about some of the things that we're thinking about to translate it into the UW context. So um, we're gonna both be giving you a little bit of context for the project. Lindley is gonna dig into how the class worked itself. It was called Let's Publish Your Thesis um, and give you an update on where the students are now. I'm then gonna be talking about the ETD process and, and student concerns at the UW and um, talking about sort of the lessons that we learned through this process and how we're hoping to um, apply it to supporting UW students in the future. So as I said, um, this was a, um, a, a class that we were invited to participate with some folks from the Jerun School of, um, or the, the Jerun Center for Global Moral Health. Um, uh, I also wanted to give a little bit of context um, for uh, the, the scholarly publishing landscape um, because we thought that it was important to also begin by addressing what can sometimes feel like a bit of a paradox in this work. Um, so our course was aimed at supporting these practitioners in publishing their work um, because there's a, really a glaring void in the academic literature, which Lynn's going to talk about. However, we also know that um, the current for-profit scholarly publishing system is both really exclusionary to under-resourced researchers um, and often shows a marked preference for research focusing on Western topics and populations. Uh, we now know that article processing charges or APCs, which are the primary way that um, for-profit publishers pay for open access, can actually cost up to half a year's pay for African researchers. Um, and we also are really aware that the modern tenure system puts way too much emphasis on publications as the primary measure of academic worth, um, far over teaching and service, which are incredibly important contributions, um, and can lead to really damaging practices like the over-reliance on impact factor as a measure of academic worth. So while we were incredibly pleased to take part in this project and help these um, practitioners take their dissertations and modify them for publication, uh, we really can't forget that there are some systemic issues that also need to be addressed in this area. And I'm gonna hand it over to Linda. Oh, thank you, Liz. So I'm gonna give you some context, the dentistry landscape in Kenya. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, 
As Liz mentioned, U University of Washington School of Public Health has had a presence in Kenya for over 30 years, and they've been working with the Daruin Center for Global Oral Health since 2015. There's very little research on oral health, dentistry, orthodontia on people in Kenya, and particularly orthodontic research and the tooth measurements are done with primarily white populations. If you were to go on PubMed or ProQuest theses and look for um, works on oral health, oral um, dentistry in Africa, you'll see most of the work is done by Westerners. Um, this is a big gap because in 2015, a national oral health survey report in Kenya reported that 34% of adults had untreated dental caries and 98% had gum disease. Uh, oral health impacts so many other parts of our lives. In a, finally, there is a shortage of dentists in Kenya. There's about 680 for a population of 50 million. So this work, having local authors give local context is so important. Next slide, please. So we got, we were awarded a Global Innovation Fund grant to pilot a project of 10 recent PhDs and help them turn their dissertations into publishable manuscripts. The purpose of the grant was to provide writing skills, knowledge about the publishing ecosystem and how to publish, as well as financial support to allow them to publish in a gold open access journal. The grant included only $10,000 to pay for APCs, and we anticipate that maybe three or four students will get that financial assistance. Next slide, please. So who was involved? Well, here's a class photo from one of our days. We had two faculty members, um, Dr. Ana Lucia Seminario from UW, Dr. Camoli from University of Nairobi. Um, there was an orthodontic professor who came in to help um, the orthodontic students with their dissertations who had a special expertise. We had three University of Washington librarians, uh, Liz and myself and our data visualization librarian and a grad student who taught Zotero. Who were the students? Uh, Dr. Camoli put an advertising flyer up at the two universities that have dental schools, and these 10 students were picked. They had finished their PhDs anywhere from three to seven years ago. Nine are living in Kenya, one in Uganda. Um, eight of them did their PhDs in Kenya, one in China, and one in the Philippines. And they are all currently teaching and seeing patients at University of Nairobi or Moy University in Mombasa. Next slide, please. There was a pre-class assessment, and you can see that um, there was a lot of concern about limited writing skills and not knowing how to submit to a journal. So all centered around the writing process. They had done tons of research, had lots of data, but weren't sure how to move on. Next slide, please. Um, they wanted support in formatting a submission and editing, both critical editing and help with their English. In a follow-up question, 90% said all of these kinds of support would it enable them to increase their um, submissions to high impact factor journals. Next slide, please. So our class ran for 10 weeks from March to June. Um, we got the grant in February and we worked iteratively with faculty to design the class. What classes should be taught in what order? Next slide, please. Um, these are the classes that we taught. Um, you can see we did started with literature reviews. A lot of the theses were based on um, data and they were older, so they needed to update their literature reviews, um, finding a journal, um, all these topics. I, next slide, please. So um, the subject specialist, the faculty, taught about the writing process, author guidelines, how to submit to a journal. Liz and Nagin and I covered the librarian skills, um, scholarly publishing and journals, copyright and contracts, uh, and different research skills. 
we had to adapt our course materials, the things we teach at UW, to a Kenyan context. Um, we really focused on free materials for both resources and tools. Next slide, please. Um, so, so Saturdays were the hands-on but fun, fun but hard work days. We started with everyone doing a 20-minute abstract of their dissertations and the wor then worked on teasing out what was the most interesting storyline or research question for a short, short article using that finer um, rubric. Each week they drafted a section, um, abstract, introduction, methodology, results, and they did peer review in small teams so that by the end of each session, each student had read their papers to each other. Next slide, please. So um, the Saturday classes were eight to 10 our time, six to eight in the evening their time. Um, again, we reviewed all the work that happened in the dissertation process. They collected lots and lots of data. And so we had to talk about the ethics of data collection, IRBs, and in one case, getting permission to use the data because it was not what the student had collected. Um, I think one of the best things about this class was the faculty gave individual feedback and worked with the students one-on-one -on, -one on their papers. And I was most impressed. The students gave each other excellent advice and feedback. Um, it, was, it was a great, great situation. So the results of the class are technically still in the works. We, didn't, we do know how the 10-week session went over, but their participants are not done yet. Next slide, please. So um, before the course, participants were given two assessments, one containing questions about basic concepts we would be covering in the class, and one asking about their general knowledge, attitude, behavior around scholarly publishing. That's where those charts I showed you earlier came from. After the course concluded, participants were given the skills test again to see whether they had absorbed the didactic content. These were short quizzes that we developed to go along with each day's lecture. We also met with the students in a structured conversation after the class without the faculty present to get um, feedback on their experience. They'll be given um, another uh, assessment once they have gone through the whole publishing cycle. Next slide, please. So the current status, um, it takes a long time for 10 people to share with 10 people um, and to get feedback and really refine things because sometimes some people weren't pulling the best storyline. Um, I'd say most of the participants finished their methods, but they didn't get any further than that. Now, um, the admin for the department is keeping on top of them and three are really far along and should be publishing shortly. Um, two or three are, are lagging a bit, but I think they can do it. Um, I've gotten a question asking uh, about certain journals. The grant funds expire in six months, in March of 2022. So we're hoping that they do get published. Um, next slide. Um, the participants told us they were very happy to learn about some free tools, especially Zotero, which they can pass on to their students. I'm not sure if I said this explicitly, but these 10 people are teaching, they're seeing patients, and they have children. We met many small children in the Zoom rooms over the course of 10 weeks, so they're very busy. They particularly appreciated how to do a literature review and what the structure of a paper is. Since they haven't gotten to the publishing phase, um, we really can't comment on that right now. Next slide, please. So the lesson learned, 10 weeks is too short. That wasn't realistic for people who are no longer in school, who are teaching, seeing patients, having you know, have families to finish in that time. And deadlines are important. I saw the admin's uh, cheat sheet of how she's keeping in touch with everyone. And I think some people are more motivated than others to get this done. There's a lot of pressure on people. And so maybe if explicit deadlines had been set up from June to November, um, so all of them would be further along. That's it. Thank you.
Thanks, Lonely. So yeah, um, this was a really fantastic uh, course and project and we learned a lot. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the reasons that I particularly was really interested in doing this project was because I'm the uh, library's liaison to the graduate school for UW's electronic thesis and dissertation program. So I was really interested to see if there were um, things that I could take into the UW context and, and help there. So giving a little background um, as to what that looks like at UW. So um, within the libraries, we offer a lot of different services that, uh, that sort of address different aspects of the publishing and, and writing cycle. Um, this takes the form of, um, or this, this happens in a number of areas. Um, my department, which is the scholarly communications and publishing department, offers support for data services, for copyright, um, the electronic thesis and dissertation um, program itself. We also have uh, liaisons all over the library offering more um, sort of traditional research skills like literature reviews, like um, honing a, a research topic. Um, and then we also have a, a dedicated service helping with citation management as well. The way this happens is um, really only very loosely coordinated. So um, there are a number of folks who do this work and provide this kind of support. The primary way that this happens is through one-on-one -on -one consultations um, where many of us are available just to, to talk to students through their particular concerns. But we also offer courses, uh, standalone courses, and a number of us are also often invited to come speak at individual classes, so forming relationships with instructors uh, to, to come speak to their class about these issues. Um, so, and, and uh, there is a lot that um, goes into this work that is sort of beyond the expertise of the library. So we have created a number of partnerships throughout the University of Washington that are really helpful in this area. Some of them I wanted to point out. Uh, the eScience Institute is the center for data science and working with big data at the university. So they have been incredibly helpful in offering support around data visualization, um, cloud computing, things like that. As I mentioned earlier, the ETD program is in fact a partnership with our graduate school. So we work really closely with them in supporting students. Uh, they focus for the for the most part on the actual graduation process itself. And the uh, ETD administrator is the platform that we use for uh, students having to upload their work. Um, so they sort of handle those kinds of questions while the library really focuses on publishing and copyright and open access and that aspect of this process. And then there's also the Odegaard Writing and Research Center, which is located in our undergraduate library. They offer a yearly um, dissertation retreat to students that I have come, um, I, have, I have talked to a number of times, but it's a pretty short session, only once a year, and really um, a, a small number of students that, that take part in that. So we get a lot of different concerns from students. Uh, there are some major themes that come up throughout these questions, however, one of which is, of course, this idea that they want to, to take the dissertation that they are currently writing and to publish it in um, either, either as an article or as a monograph afterwards. So uh, there are a number of issues that students face here. Um, of course, there's the uh, different publisher policies on preprints and uh, students really are unsure about whether their publishers will be okay with having their dissertation out available in the world. But we also have an issue in that, um, as I said, we use the ETD administrator system for students to upload their work. That thesis or dissertation through that platform gets put in two different places, both in the ProQuest dissertation database and also ResearchWorks, which is University of Washington's institutional repository, which is meant to be an open access repository. So according to the graduate school policy, all theses and dissertations must eventually be made openly available, but they do get to choose the, the timing on that. Unfortunately, the options for timing and access for ResearchWorks are different than for ProQuest. And so there's just a lot of confusing 
confusion about how those two systems interact and how to actually select the appropriate options so that effectively get they get the, uh, the, the embargo, the restriction that they want. So thinking about overall learning objectives in this area, we really want to be helping students thinking about how to find a publisher, um, you know, evaluating fit and quality and impact, but then also particularly looking at their publisher policies for how those publishers feel about preprints and dissertations. And then of course, we want to be offering them some um, more concrete information about how the ETD administrator system works as well. We also get a lot of questions on the flip side of that. So there are a number of degree programs that offer what's sometimes called the free article thesis um, option. So this is where students um, simply write and publish articles and effectively staple them together with, with some introduction and, and context. And when uh, they do this, oftentimes students are signing uh, fairly restrictive copyright agreements, authors agreements. So um, many students aren't aware that they're giving up their copyright, which of course has implications for whether they can reuse those works within their thesis or dissertation and has implications for us as to whether we can um, get that license to distribute it. There's also the issue that ProQuest is a for-profit company. And even if some publishers are okay with having preprints out in the world, there are a number of them that actually specifically say it must be nonprofit use. So um, that can be an issue for students as well. So again, thinking about the overall learning objectives that we want in this area, um, helping students, students figure out both what the uh, context for their, their, the, their copyrights within University of Washington, but then also how that interacts with publisher policies um, and the contracts that they're going to be signing with, um, with those publishers. And then, of course, we just get a lot of general copyright and licensing questions. There's, uh, there are two aspects of ETD Administrator in particular that students um, trip up on sometimes. Uh, one is around the copyright registration that ProQuest offers. University of Washington has students keep the copyright of their theses and dissertations. But when students are faced with this question, do you want to register your copyright? Oftentimes they think, wait, does that not mean that I have my copyright? If I don't have it registered, does that mean I don't have copyright? So there's a lot of confusion there. Uh, and then of course we give the opportunity for students to add Creative Commons licenses as well to their thesis and dissertations. And we get a lot of questions about what does that mean? What's the best one for me? Um, so thinking about, again, what we wanna be the, the goals for, for learning for students, um, understanding the specific UW context for copyright and, and how their copyright works for their thesis and dissertation is really important. Again, the, the ins and outs of that ETD administrator system. And then of course, the broader creative commons and um, helping students understand what those licenses mean and how to figure out which one to pick. So um, as we said, uh, there was um, a, a, the, the process of putting together the Let's Publish Your Thesis course was really fantastic in that it brought together a lot of this information that we already give um, and that we haven't, we haven't really figured out how to package well for University of Washington students. So we are um, currently trying to figure out how to um, better do that for students. And really what we are focusing on in the next couple of quarters um, is putting together a Canvas class. So uh, we are um, instructional design and outreach service department is uh, there are online learning specialists uh, and they have a number of classes at this point that they offer um, that are asynchronous classes. So oftentimes it will be a week long class where that week is scheduled, but the work itself, students can do on their own time. So we put the content in Canvas, um, and then instructors can interact with students through the discussion feature of Canvas. The, the online learning folks are also playing with Slack integration as a way of uh, connecting with students rather than that discussion feature. So we have some 
um, we have some playing around to do as to what the actual best way of, of doing that is. So one of the things that um, in working with, uh, with the online learning folks, um, it's been really clear that teaching uh, an online asynchronous class is not the same thing as teaching an in-person synchronous class. Uh, and one of the primary issues is being able to really distill what the most important information is in a way that is um, as direct and to the point as possible. Giving more, con more information um, means it's actually more likely that students will not absorb it. So really getting to the point um, and really honing in on what the, the most important ideas are is um, we've done a lot of work in thinking about what that actually looks like. So we're thinking that we're going to be focusing overall on uh, four topics. First, that kind of general idea of um, how to choose a publisher, which of course, again, we have that fit quality and impact um, structure that we use, but then also adding on assessing the publisher policies in the context of the fact that your dissertation will be openly available. We know that we also really want to um, focus on copyright in general, contracts, publishing contracts in particular, the Creative Commons licensing and, and how that works, and then putting it all together uh, and really focusing on how these issues play out in ETE administrator and how you go and, and make the correct selections for your particular circumstance. The way that we do this, uh, the, the Canvas class is gonna be organized into modules. The, um, the one that I'm showing here is actually a separate uh, data management focused class that I've been involved with, but it, it really shows the structure that we try to aim for, which is you, um, you, you give the overall topic, you give some resources around that topic, you give an activity that's, um, it's not a graded activity, it's, it's basically just designed to have the students play around with the resources that you've just introduced with them. And then you give them a discussion prompt and ask them to uh, use the discussion feature ask questions and have the instructors interact with the students within that discussion feature uh, to, to help them um, figure out what's going on for that particular topic. We, uh, so for the Let's Publish Your Thesis class, the um, School of Dentistry folks really took the lead on the assessment, but the libraries we do things a little bit differently. Uh, we have a pretty standard assessment survey that we give to students at the end of the class. But we've also started playing around with some new self-reflection techniques. So uh, UW, it's um, been really exciting at, at UW Libraries that we've recently opened the Open Scholarship Commons, which is a center for open research. Again, trying to sort of better bring together this kind of support in a way that, that users uh, can find it. So through the Open Scholarship Commons, we have this practice now of um, a, a formal structured self-reflection that we do after events and courses. Um, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what kinds of things might we want to change, how much time and effort would be necessary in order to make those changes, that sort of thing. And then we also, all the folks who are doing work associated with the Open Scholarship Commons, we meet on a quarterly basis to have a group reflection. So um, again, sharing best practices, what went well, what didn't go well, um, so, that, so that we can all learn from each other through this work. Now, the one piece of this that um, I'm personally still uh, kind of struggling with, we, it was so clear through the Let's Publish Your Thesis process that yes, the didactic information was important, but it was that hands-on information or that, that hands-on practice and really that very specific interaction with uh, subject matter experts that was so useful for the students. Um, for articles uh, in particular, where, where the structure of articles can be very different depending on what discipline you're in, um, it's really important to, to have folks who know that work um, be the ones working with the students there. For monographs, uh, we are really fortunate in that we have a good relationship with uh, the University of Washington Press. So they can give some context about that process. Of but um, we know that this is a significant 
um, need for students. And, and we know that the participants in Let's Publish Your Thesis really found that aspect of it to be you know, one of the most valuable pieces of the course. And so that's an area that we are still trying to figure out how best to address. So that's the end of our formal presentation part. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. The, um, I have some questions, um, but let me start with one in the in the Q and A chat. Uh, Jonah McAllister, Erica writes: Have you found a publisher that isn't willing to grant permission? I've not encountered one that won't eventually. It may take some effort. Often speaking with a real person does the trick. Yeah, I also have not. Um, again, if you can do it on that on that getting a student to talk with their editor level, you know, it is so common for students to be taking dissertation work and um, and turning it into articles. Like publishers were, would be really shooting themselves in the foot if they if they didn't let folks do this. So. Yeah, and on an anecdotal level, I have not experienced that. It would be interesting to see if, if there are examples, though. Thank you. I'm wondering, uh, Liz and Lindley, if you have a sense of how to translate the course that you developed um, into students from other disciplines. Yeah, and, and I think that that's really one of the central issues. I think the um, the piece the, the pieces of it that are consistent, um, the the general framework of finding a publisher, which is um, you know the the we we talk about fit, impact, and quality, which really are sort of universal um, things that that people should be thinking about. Um, the general copyright system is, of course, universally applicable. It's it's really that um, that structure piece of the articles themselves and the, the nitty gritty of taking you know their three hundred pages of work and getting it down into the thirty page article that is the discipline specific piece of it, mm -hmm. and and that's where we were so fortunate to be able to work with our subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the piece that really we haven't quite figured out how to translate for the for the wider audience. I mean, I think it's just gonna need to be partnerships with more subject matter experts. But, certainly, yeah. certainly. And it seems like the components of your program could be plugged in to another discipline. Certainly. Exactly, exactly. You are at four minutes. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I have another question. Um, this is really exciting to me. And I'm wondering what advice would you give to um, your colleagues who are, were just starting out, just wanted to um, create an initiative like the one that you've done? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it would be important to um, get a good sense of what the what the local needs are. Um, you know, if if your university does focus on lens, um, you know, I've been I've been at UW in this position for three years now, and so those patterns of what the questions are that students ask, we feel pretty confident that that at least overall, we, we know where to pinpoint there. So just getting a sense of what the need is to begin with. And then just starting to break down, you know, what does the publishing process look like? What, what are the steps that everybody has to go through? Um, and can you start, is, are, is there information that you have available that you can start plugging into that overall publishing life cycle um, to start mm -hmm. making something bigger? start. I don't know if Lindley, if you have stuff to add there. The only thing I was going to add is um, if you're just getting started and this is something you want to do is to find a champion. You know, we all have certain faculty members who we have close relationships with. And uh, Dr. Seminario is so, um, she's really dedicated to increasing research capacity, especially in underserved communities. So this, she drove the car at the beginning and then we all jumped on. 
-hmm. but uh, having that champion or that um, having a faculty driver is really important. Yeah, that seems really wise. I mean, students who are, especially doctoral students who are embarking on academic careers are all expected to publish. And it's this mysterious process that no one teaches you how to how to bridge that first gap into your, you know, as an as an early career researcher. How do you begin this? And it's nothing like um, doing coursework. It's it's also not a lot like writing a dissertation. It's a different kind of um, direction with a different skill set um, and different necessary resources. And I, I'm just, I think this is a, a wonderful program. I'm so glad you shared it with us. I also think that the that just the, the beginning aspect of getting students to think of themselves and the work that they do as worthy of being shared, just even understanding that publishing is an option is really um, not on many students' radar. And so getting them used to the idea that the work that they're doing has value and that it could be um, something that could be published formally is, um, I, I think can be very transformative for students in how they view their overall coursework um, and, and how they, they view their career pro progression as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I don't have any other questions in the chat and I want to uh, really sincerely thank you for presenting on your topic. Uh, it was really very interesting and has got wheels turning in my head and I'm sure um, the, the, our other colleagues who attended. So thank you for your brilliant program. And I'm sorry that you have had so many technical difficulties today, but it didn't look like it when, <laughs> when you did your presentation. So Perfect. thank you so much for being here and thank you participants. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thank you. Bye.